Revelation 20 verse 4, the Bible says, I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was committed to them and they lived and reigned with Christ at the end of that verse for a thousand years. If you were to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 2 and 3, it affirms, it supports, it, it backs up this same notion. Can truly the people who were redeemed from the earth, how will they sit in judgment? Isn't God the only true judge? Yes, he is. He is the ancient of days. He is, uh, he is the eternal judge. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, in agreement with Revelation 24, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? I heard one preacher say, and it was just so good to me. I'm going to repeat it. Be careful because when Jesus came the first time, they were looking for a king of glory and they got a king of grace. When he comes again, he will establish his glory. And so if you want to have your glory now, you might not get grace. And he says here about this, be careful who you judge now, because if you judge now, you may take up all the judging that God had planned for you to do in the thousand years. So just don't judge until God gives you a throne to sit on to judge. The saved, everybody that's been redeemed, everybody that's been transformed, those who have put on immortality and in, in corruption, even, even good angels maybe. We're not exactly entirely crystal clear on, on who else will participate, but we know that the redeemed of the earth will participate in the judgment during this 1,000 year period. The cases of all who are lost including the devil and his angels, will be reviewed. This judgment will clear up any questions that the saved might have about those who were lost. Well, Lord, is there anything else you could have done for a thousand years? We will look over the books and we will be able to see that God did everything in all of his power to save every person. Here... At the end of that judgment, we find that something will happen. Something significant will happen. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, go there with me. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 and 3. I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Just go on here. It says, and I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Now, this is really powerful if you understand the message of the sanctuary. Because when he gave the instruction to Moses, he said, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them here. Something significant is about to happen because he is not anymore referencing an earthly sanctuary. He is saying, according to Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says that the tabernacle of God is now with men. God is not with men in an earthly sanctuary. The sanctuary of God, the tabernacle of God, he has now moved to be with men. Now, this is powerful when you consider when Jesus came the first time, his first advent, his first coming, he came as a baby, placed in a manger. How significant that Jesus, he has been referred to as the bread of life or the living bread. Bethlehem, it means house of bread. How fitting a manger, you know, as a food dish for, for animals. It's a trough. How fitting that the bread of life was born in the house of bread and put in a food dish served to the world. Here, he comes to establish the kingdom of grace. When he comes the second time that we talked about last night, the second coming of Jesus Christ, the coming he promises in John 14, 1 through 3, the coming that is talked about in Matthew chapter 24, all of the signs that will occur just before he returns. This coming now, this is a third coming. This, when he comes the second time, he doesn't come as a babe. He comes as a king and all of the heavenly hosts come with him. But this time, this third advent, he does not, Christ does not dispatch. The residents of heaven are not dispatched. This time he moves the whole city towards the earth. How significant is it that God is ready to move a city? You have a problem moving house when it's time. But God is about to move the throne of the universe. 
The Bible says in Zechariah chapter 14, behold, in verse one, the day of the Lord is coming in verse four. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. In verse four, then the Mount of Olives shall be split in two. Thus the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with you. All the land shall be turned into a plain. Here we understand according to the word of God that he will bring that holy city, New Jerusalem. Now this is not a simple feat. This is not a mobile city like his throne that has these holy flaming wheels on the right and on the left. This is not like that. This is, this is the resident throne of God for the entire universe. Just the city alone is something significant. If you were to lay the city out and, and map it out according to the plans that were shared in Revelation chapter 21, the city is a perfect square. Every wall, the east wall, the north wall, the south wall, the west wall, 375 miles long, every single one of them. Almost 700 kilometers. Here gates of the city, 12 of them. There's three on each wall. Now, if you've got a God, like Morgan says, who puts three gates on four walls, he puts three gates on every wall, 12 gates in the city. This doesn't sound like the kind of God that's trying to keep you out. This sounds like the kind of God that wants to make sure as many as possible will be saved foundations there are 12 of them laid out precious stone one after the other emerald and onyx and ruby and chrysolite beryl topaz turquoise jacinth amethyst sapphire agate all of them make up the foundations laid from east to west in the holy city the streets according to revelation chapter 21 verse 21 they are made of transparent gold if you are able let me tell you something there's a significance to why god makes the foundations of the city precious jewels it is not only because they represent the tribes of israel or the people of god both spiritual and literal it is also because he knows that the day was going to come when he would move the city and so he makes the foundation transparent so that when the city travels through the universe you can see through the walls through the streets and through the ground to see everything that he's created the city is, according to Revelation 21, verse 2, is beautifully dressed for her husband and it shines with the glory of God. There are majestic features in this city. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2, in the middle of its street. And let me tell you something. The devil wants us to stop talking about Revelation. The devil wants to convince us in overwhelming tide that revelation is not something that people need to hear. But how many of you know that there's nothing more precious than talking about God's plan for his children? Amen. Here in that city in the middle of its street, Revelation 22, 2, and on either side of the river is the tree of life. And the tree of life it sits on the, 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 the trunk and the roots sit on two sides of a river, even though it's one tree. The tree of life, it bears 12 fruit, each yielding a fruit every month. The leaves of the trees are for the healings of the nations. According to Genesis 3.22, if you were to take also of the tree of life and eat, you'd live forever. This is why Satan, I mean, God had to prevent Adam and Eve from eating of the tree because they would have forever perpetuated sin. The wage of sin had to take its course, but the tree of life interrupts that curse because it perpetuates life. Can you imagine God is so full of life? He can, he can create a tree that gives life eternal. But the gift only comes from Jesus. Here, the Bible says that that holy city, it descends. But there's something that happens as it comes to the earth, or as it comes to the earth. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1, all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up. In 2 Peter 3.10, the elements will melt with fervent heat, both the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Here, we understand over and over according to scripture, that God will cleanse the earth one last time. Last week, I must have said at some point in my sermon that 
you know, we can't lower the walls of, of, our, of our faith and we can't tear down the gates because if we do that, all types of people will come in. And, and for anyone that misinterpreted that to believe that I was saying that we have to keep people out, you misunderstood what I was saying. And I want to be crystal clear about this. What I'm saying is that the word of God is our sure foundation. The word of God not only is our foundation, but it provides us protection from an overwhelming tide of vicious violence against the people and the will of God for his children. And here as a church, it is not our responsibility to try to keep people out. It is our responsibility to tell the world Jesus is coming back. He has a plan and to make room for them. Can I love someone that doesn't believe what I believe? Yes, I can. Can I work to, to support people that don't live the lifestyle that I live? Yes, I can. Can I be a light to people that are going through difficult times? Yes, I can. It is not the call of the church to maintain purity amongst the people of God. The wheat and tares must grow together until the Lord comes because he alone knows. I remember years ago, a preacher used to say that the biggest surprise when you get to heaven, you will not say, I'm surprised she's here. The biggest surprise is that will be that you made it there. <laughs> and so for anybody here who's struggling with identity, trying to find your way, if uh, they're members of the LGBTQ community, members of the Muslim community, the Catholic community, the, the, the Jewish community, no matter what walk of life you come from, I want you to know Jesus didn't die for seven day of business, he died for the world. He died to make room in his kingdom for every single person. And the only standard that we have to uphold is the love of God for his children. Mm -hmm. Changing people is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Should you preach the truth? Should you tell the truth? Absolutely. Yes, you should. I want to divert here, and I shared this at the leadership uh, conference. I think this is my last year to speak. They're not probably going to let me speak anywhere anymore ever again. And uh, this is about it. I'm going to go back to the Bay Community Church where people love me. My members love me. I love my members. My pastor, Pastor Saul, but now we're just going to do our work at the Bay. We got water. We got Jesus. That's all we need. But here, I had, my church was in the heart of the city, and I had two lesbian couples whose children were connected with our children's ministry. And one of the, this couple, they came uh, to me and they said, hey, we like to talk. I said, sure, no problem. We love everybody. We make room for everybody. I, I believe in pastoring for the community. And pastors, can I let you in on a secret? If your ministry is based on how happy your members are, you have failed in ministry. Your pastoral ministry is to the community. And if your whole goal is to only make your members happy, you are serving the laws of men and not the laws of God. You have to stand for the right no matter what. You've got to be able to say, sister so-and-so, your bad attitude will not work in this place anymore. You got to be able to tell brother so-and-so, I love you enough to let you know that what you are doing is not right. That's free. Nobody has to pay for that. And so here I met with a couple and they said, Pastor, you know, our daughter wants to get baptized and she she uh, is fully heterosexual and she believes the word of God and, and she believes that this church is where she wants to be. And we fully support her decision. But what what does what does the Bible really say about who we are and, and what we are? And I said, listen, this is what the Bible says. And I shared with them how God created man and woman and how it's his desire that they would be fruitful and multiply and how sin has marred the image of God in the world and changed things on us. And God has a plan to change, deliver and, 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 and heal any heart. He, this is God's will. And they said, okay, well, what does your church teach about this? I said, well, this is what the church says. And the church's official response is that we should love everyone, but God does have a plan. He has a standard. And this is, we subscribe to what the word of God says. And they said, well, what did you say? I said, this is what I say. I believe in what the church teaches. I believe what the Bible teaches. And, and I fundamentally hold true to that. Does that mean I stop loving you? Does that mean I stop supporting you? Does that mean I stop figuring out ways to, 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 to minister to your life? No, absolutely not. Jesus came for everybody. And it's not his desire that anyone should perish and so 
I gave them the, the, the textbook answer that I would give as a minister of the gospel, and they left. And I said, well, I, you know, that's probably going to be the last time I see them. And, and I just accepted that. So the next week, I'm preaching, and Ellen, right there, they're sitting right where they always sat. And I said, man, wow, this is unbelievable. And they came back. And so then another week passed and I saw them and they, they finally, after two or three, about the third week, they said, hey, John, can we see you? I said, what's up? They said, every time you see us, you act so surprised. <laughs> Boy, you know, I'm up preaching like, welcome, happy Sabbath. Oh, hey, yeah, good to see y'all. I had no idea that you were going to come here. And they said, John, what, why do you act so surprised? I said, well, when I share with you what I share with you, I thought you were going to stop coming. They said, we've been to a lot of churches. And every pastor has told us what we wanted to hear and not told us what the word of God says. We are struggling with this and we have to deal with this and we will deal with this by God's grace. But we're coming here because you are willing to tell the truth in love. And so when I say we have to be careful not to tear down our standards, I'm saying to be clear that we have to be careful not to compromise because that thing will creep up on you and you will be washed away when great confusion comes. Is that all right? Okay, that's free. Uh, maybe I'll get, get a haystack for that. <laughs> so here now, the holy city, it comes. It descends down from heaven out of God. And, and, and what happens is significant because you and I, we're, we're, we're riding because we're going to be saved by God's grace. We're riding in this holy city. And when it comes to the earth, we understand that the earth is left desolate. It is left void and without form. Satan has been bound to the earth because he is not allowed to travel anywhere else in the universe and make war against the people of God. He has done all the damage he could do. The cup of his iniquity is completely full and he is bound to the world without anyone to tempt. And here, when Christ comes again, because he is life everlasting, he is the resurrection the wicked who were slain when Jesus came in the second advent, they were slain by the glory of the coming of God. The wicked are now given life. God is so powerful that he's got to give his enemies the power they need to oppose him. Because he is life, eternal. And so now the wicked are, they come to life. This is a second resurrection. The wicked come to life. It is not like the first resurrection. When they come to life, they come to life just as they die. There is no change. Their mindset is still the same. Their heart still against God. Their passions still debased. The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 9, Satan will go out to deceive the nations of the earth to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So here, the holy city is just hovering above the earth. And all of the dead who died without accepting Jesus Christ, Satan convinces them in this resurrection as he did in life that he is the one who has brought them back to life. He goes around and tells the people who have this lofty stature, these brilliant intellects, he tells them, I'm the one that brought you back. Do you see the vast number of followers that I have? Look at that city. It's a big city, but we have enough of us that we can take over this city. And his deception is just as true as it always was. Bible tells us what happens next is an absolute strange act. Before I get to that, as that holy city comes, as the wicked rise, those who died without Christ, those who died against the Lord, those who refused to accept the love of Jesus Christ. I just they said, I just don't want his love. No matter how many warnings, no matter how many proddings, no matter how much pleading, they refuse to accept it. And God doesn't force his will on anyone. He loves everybody. He has a plan. He's ordained for our lives. He has a path. It's narrow. And he asks us to walk it by the power of his Holy Spirit. For the first time in all of history, every person who has ever lived on the earth is alive. The wicked and the dead. And this great controversy, it comes to a climactic end. 
The Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9. We already understand that Satan, he is preparing to surround the city. He heralds a call for all of the wicked to destroy the city. He has already vowed and professed with his own tongue simply by the sheer majesty of the coming of the Lord. Every person has already bowed in the presence of God by the sheer majesty of the coming of God. Just like the centurion at the cross, who's the soldier at the cross, who says, surely this was the son of God. He was compelled to profess it because of what he saw in Jesus Christ. Here, every person proclaims this. And then Satan, he lifts his banner and he tells every wicked person on the planet to take the city. When he does that, Revelation chapter 20, verse 9, tells us what happens. It says, fire. It comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And this, this is the second death. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 65 verse 17, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. Hell does not burn forever. It burns up because God would not create a new heaven and a new earth if hell is continually burning. This is, this is as it is. The Bible explains itself. He is not a, a God who would desire to see uh, people suffering for eternity. That would, that's why the Bible even calls this, this act of hell's fire a strange act. It is an act of mercy because he knows that as he establishes his kingdom of righteousness on the earth, those who desire to have no relationship with him would find no joy in his eternal home. And so here, as Satan goes to take the city, there is a fire that is hotter than any hot that this world has ever known. Isn't it interesting that there are really two ways to clean things, water and fire. He cleansed the world once with water, and now he cleanses it with fire. Satan and all of his followers are consumed by this fire. That's why it would be better now, my friend, to burn with the fire of the Holy Spirit. God, too, wants us to be cleansed and on fire, but cleansed by the water of baptism cleansed by the blood of Jesus and on fire with the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't burn for God, we will burn for Satan. That is not a message of fear. That is a message of intent. This is Satan's plan for us. He wants us to burn with him. But God has a way of escape for us. Christ he will cry his very last tear because of sin. His throne is high and lifted up above the city. As the holy city lands, as where the Bible says it will land, the mountain breaks in two and it turns into a vast plain. Jesus steps out of the city and here again, Christ, the one who opens the gates, he opens the gates. And as he steps out, we get to witness something that no human being has ever witnessed in all of history. A recreation. The earth is no longer separated by seas and water. He gathers all of the land together. And then he tells the earth to bring forth. There is no need for him to create any new form of light. The sun has bowed out of, its, out of his path when the holy city came through, when he trod through in the second advent. There's no need for sunlight in this place because the glory of the Father lights the holy city. And there is no night there. As he steps out of the city, he tells the land to bring forth. And one inspired writer, she says that as the grass comes forth, as it stands still, it stands still in real green. But if it blows to the east, it appears as if it's gold. And if it blows to the west, it appears like silver. We understand that there are homes that have been built by Jesus himself for the followers that he has prepared a place for him as he promised he would. But now he is about to create the earth all over again. We understand that the lions and the lambs, they graze together in this place because there's no death there. 
I'm sorry, non-vegetarians and vegans. There's no death there. <laughs> oh, oh. She says that she picks up a flower. She can carry it for hundreds of years and enjoy its beauty. And wherever she lays it down, it just takes root again. The children in that place, there'll be children that grow up there in that holy city. Even if they climb the great mountain that exists there, as they fall back from that great mountain, we understand that their wings will catch them and carry them to the top. You and I, we're witnessing right now as I talk through this, a place that is very different than the place we know. Isaiah chapter 35 says that the deserts will be replaced by gardens. Vast oceans as we know them today will be completely gone according to Revelation 21.1. Today, oceans cover about 70 or more percent of the earth's surface. This will not be the case in God's new earth. The whole world will be one huge garden of unsurpassed beauty and it will be interspersed with fresh river, rivers, freshwater rivers and lakes and, and mountains according to Acts 3.20 and 21, Revelation 22. Every animal will be tame. The Bible says there'll be no curse there, no curse of sin, no sickness, no death, no disease. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 18 tells us there'll be no violence there. There'll be no need for war there. Nothing will be defiling in that place. Little children will walk on the streets of gold according to Zechariah chapter 8 verse 5 and they'll get to grow up in a world. Children that, whose lives were cut short before their time, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, they'll get to grow up in a place in complete perfection. Somebody once said, oh, we won't know each other because uh, we'll be so different. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, then I shall know just as I also am known. While we're there, we'll, we will build houses in the new earth. Which means that we'll have a, a home estate in the city and we'll have a house outside of the city in the earth made new. This will be the first time you've got two properties and you won't even go to sleep because there's no resting there because there's no need to get tired. The saved, according to John, will build their own houses in the new earth. Isaiah 65 says, my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. When you build there rust and moth, it won't come in and corrupt. Throughout all of the ceaseless ages of eternity, we will learn more of God's plans. One small few sentences says that there will be a room for each person. And in that room, there'll be gifts that have been packaged. And these will be the answers that we never got when we were on the earth. We will understand in the sweet by and by. Why does God want us to know his revelation of Jesus? Because it is a revealing of Jesus, his love and his plan for eternity. Satan wants us to focus on the time we live in. But God, he wants us to know that there is a city bright and fair, not made with the hands of men for everyone that overcomes by the blood of the Lamb. All week we've talked from the book of Revelation and we've lifted up a simple message, singular in nature. God has a plan. And it includes you. We see where Jesus has stood in the gap for us, sacrificed everything and picked it back up for us. The final question I want to ask in this very last sermon is what will you do for him? You can't offer him a holy city. You can't offer him streets of gold. You can't even offer him streets of money printed, much less gold. You have no glory to offer him. 
So that means that the reasonable thing we should give is our lives as a living sacrifice. This is what he asks us for. Our musicians are coming and I'm closing and this is our final message. Here everything has been laid plain and bare. All things have come to pass as the word of the Lord said it would. The Bible, it is as true then as it is now. Jesus has redeemed the world. There is no trace of sin anywhere in the universe. And throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, Christ, he, he alone, bears the mark of sin. Soon, and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the King. No more dying there. No more crying there. We are going to see the King. Christ not only stands in the gap, but he provides a place of escape for us and his eternal kingdom right and fair. Our team are passing cards out to every person now. If you filled out a card last night, that's fine. Make sure if you haven't filled out one, you take one now. In just a moment, I want to make a very special appeal. One, I want to let you know these messages based in Revelation one of the persons on Wednesday night when Morgan made an appeal for rebaptism, and baptism is not the, it is not the end of, of a journey. It does not indicate that you have arrived. It is a beginning. The instance of rebaptism in Acts 19 is an indication where people were baptized because they knew it was right, but they had not received the Holy Spirit. That is the context for that. That's the context. But on that night, someone responded to that appeal amongst the many that did. And they said to me this morning, John, I've fallen in love with Jesus all over again. I can see Jesus in Revelation. Thank you for talking about the great controversy. And he went out and he took what he had and he brought as many copies of the book Steps to Christ as he could afford. 400 copies. Amen. He brought every available copy of the great controversy Amen. and he brought it here this morning and he put it on a table as, and he says, as I prepare to be rebaptized, I want people to know I've come in contact with the spirit of the living God. And I want every person to know about the love of Jesus and his victory in the great controversy. And so if you're here today and you want a copy of one of those or both of those books, I want to invite you, you can take them for free when it's time to leave. Don't get up yet. You get a copy. That's what the Spirit of God does to hearts. Dozens of young people have made decisions, young adults. Many have made decisions to be baptized. Many to serve. Today you have that card. The first thing I want you to do is fill out all of your contact information because we want to plug you in to young adult ministry in your area. If you have not yet made a decision for baptism, don't put it off. I want you to make that decision right now. Just check the box that says, I'd like to be baptized. Make sure you do that. Now you heard about the church plants in Newcastle and in Port Macquarie and uh, all in the Southern region and in Port Macquarie. If you wanna be a part of one of those church plants, you wanna serve the Lord, you'd like to be a part of what's happening in that space, I want you to put in the notes area church plant. Just put church plant or a big CP and we'll plug you in. We'll make sure that we can plug you in with the team. Maybe you feel God is calling you to plant a church in your area and it's not in the Newcastle area or in Port Macquarie and, and you'd like to be a part of something in your area. Just fill out the information, put CP, we'll figure that out later. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to call you to fill out those cards and we want you to come and we want you to just put them right here. This is our very last appeal at the 18 plus 10 for Big Camp. 
dozens and dozens and dozens of people have made different decisions. And what I want to encourage you to do is I want you to make a decision. Because while salvation is for everyone, it is also very personal. Christ died for you. He has a plan for your life. He wants to guide you by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's coming back for you. Father, in Jesus' name, as cards are being filled out, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will cast our eyes on Calvary. That your Holy Spirit will call our attention to the fact that you will come soon. Father, we pray this prayer for every decision being made in Jesus' name. As this song is sung, I'm going to shut my mouth. I'm going to sit down. And as this song is sung, sung, as you fill out those cards for baptism, some of you, you need to just do it. Just go for it. Respond to what God is calling you to do in your heart. I promise you, you will not tell you to get baptized. The devil will not tell you to get baptized. So if you sense the call to check that box, that's the spirit of the living God. Do that. You will not tell you to be a part of a church plan. You will not tell you to do that. Satan will not tell you to do that. So if you sense the call to do that, make sure you just write that church plan or CP on it. If you want to click one of the other boxes, speak to someone about my journey, have Bible study, do that as well. You can click as many as you want. It's free of charge. Jesus paid the price. The Bible studies cost money, but you'll give an offering, but we'll still give them to you for free. But right now, as this song is sung, maybe for the first time or for the first time in a long time, you want to just come lay it down. Just like we did last night, I want to invite you to do that. Oh, mm -hmm.